Good morning and welcome. I do have several notices and welcome to Tony as well, who is leading our service this morning. Thank you. But it's me again as well. <laughs> I don't think anyone's, well, I hope no one's complaining. Um, and um, as I said last week, from now on, from this month on, hopefully our communion service will be the first Sunday of each month, and certainly next month when it's the covenant service, and Helen will be leading it that day. I have a message from the property committee. Um, I said last week that various jobs are being done and if you know of anything outstanding there is a blue maintenance book in the crush hall that you can write in but there is a big job the, that the electricians have to do and they will be working in the church in January and it will be completely out of bounds for groups and anything else from Tuesday the 4th of January to Friday the 7th so all groups are suspended for that week and I know it sounds like next year but it will come very quickly hopefully the online fundraising quizzes will start again in January on the third Monday evening which will be January the 17th and please let Mike Haynes know if you want to join in there will be a zoom prayer meeting at 8 o'clock on Wednesday and the coffee morning on Zoom at 10.30 on Thursday. A message from Tom, who is in charge of the singing on, um, <clears throat> on December the 19th. That's the nativity service at 10.30 a.m. and carols by candlelight at 6.30 and then carol singing in the New Street area but anyone wanting to learn the songs for the nativity service is welcome to stay for a short while after this morning service and after the morning service next Sunday. And there will be a dress rehearsal on Saturday the 18th of December at 9.45 to 11. And one final notice. Last night's concert, although I wasn't there, I've been told was excellent and it raised £150. And now I will pray, and after I've prayed, Diane and Mike are going to light the next two, the, the first, well, <laughs> number one and number two Advent candles. Shall we pray? Our Father God, we thank you for keeping us through this past week with all its pre-Christmas busyness. Help us to still our minds, to remember the coming of Jesus, God made flesh, and to let you fill us again with your spirit of hope and peace. Please bless Tony as he leads our service. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we begin our celebration of Advent. On these four Sundays leading up to Christmas, we will rejoice in the great gift that is ours in Jesus Christ. To help us celebrate each Sunday, we will light a candle, remembering that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. On this first Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of hope. <laughs> hope is our assurance that God will finish all he has started hope is our confidence that he will do all he has promised all the promises of God are fulfilled, fulfilled in Jesus Christ he is our hope today and forever Thanks, Thanks be, to, be God to God for, for his indescribable gift. On this, this second Sunday of Advent, as we think about the coming of Jesus Christ, we light the candle of peace.
Jesus Christ is our peace. He is the Prince of Peace, and the fruit of his presence is peace. Christ comes to bring justice, wholeness and harmony to every relationship throughout all creation. He wants to continually bring us peace in every situation. Jesus, we pray, guide our feet into the path of peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Diane and Mike. Uh, am I right in thinking we sing part of hymn 176 now? Second verse, verse 2 of hymn 176. Well, it's good to be with you again this morning. It's only two weeks since I was here. Well, I was here last week as well, but in the congregation. Some words from St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 3. Someone is shouting in the desert, Get the road ready for the Lord. Make a straight path for him to travel. Every valley must be filled up. Every hill and mountain leveled off. The winding ways must be made straight and the rough places made smooth. The whole human race will see God's salvation. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O God, our Father, we thank you for the Advent message of hope, for the Advent message of peace. We thank you for the challenge to make the rough places smooth, to bring the mountains low and to prepare the way for the Lord. Father God, we praise you for this season of Advent when we are reminded once again of the ways in which Jesus Christ comes into the world at large, comes afresh into the church and comes afresh into our lives. And as we offer our praise for these things, we also offer our frailty. We offer the times when we have found it hard to make the rough places smooth. For we have dealt with people and found it difficult to smooth the pathway of life for them. We have dealt with people and found that we were reluctant to wear down the mountains in front of them so that they may have an easier pathway through life. We offer our confessions for all the times when we have failed to rise to the challenge that you set before us and the times when we have failed to admit Jesus Christ into our hearts even though he has sought to come afresh. Father God, we seek afresh your forgiveness, therefore. We seek, for the power of, seek the power of your Holy Spirit to enable us truly to climb the mountains and to level them, to tackle the rough ways and to make them smooth, and to be the means whereby the pathway of other people through life is made smoother and that their hearts also are led to the love of Jesus Christ. As we offer our prayers of confession, may we receive once again the promise and the assurance of your forgiving grace moving upon us and within us. In Jesus' name, amen. And now we have our Old Testament lesson.
The reading is taken from Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 to 4, and it's page 926 in the Church Bibles. The Lord Almighty answers, I will send my messenger to prepare the way for me. Then the Lord you are looking for will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger you long to see will come and proclaim my covenant. But who will be able to endure the day when he comes? Who will be able to survive when he appears? He will be like strong soap, like a fire that refines metal. He will come to judge like one who refines and purifies silver. As a metal worker refines silver and gold, so the Lord's messenger will purify the priests, so that they will bring to the Lord the right kind of offerings. Then the offerings which the people of Judah and Jerusalem bring to the Lord will be pleasing to him as they used to be in the past. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Janice. And now we turn to the hymn book again, and we sing, it's one of the newer Advent hymns, uh, number 189, Wild and Lone, the prophet's voice echoes through the desert still. And if you're using a tune edition of the hymn book, we sing it to the tune Aberystwy. I think that uh, one of the most profound statements in the Old Testament is to be found in that passage from Malachi that we had this morning. Malachi chapter, chapter 3 verse 1 where it says, The Lord you are looking for will suddenly come to his temple. It is, like a number of passages of Scripture, one of those things which is true at different levels. First of all, I think it is a few words which, or they are a few words which are true at the level of individuals. Do you remember Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 6? He said, Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now link that with Malachi. The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. He comes to people as individuals. There are countless examples in the scripture of people to whom God has come suddenly and unexpectedly sometimes seemingly out of the blue, like it was for Paul, for example, on, on his journey to Damascus. Suddenly, God came like a flash of blinding light. Or there was Isaiah in the Old Testament. We don't know what Isaiah was doing precisely at the time, but what we do know is that in chapter 6 of Isaiah, it says that in the, king, in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord, and Isaiah was aware of the magnificence and the splendor of the heavenly temple. But that, that was the presence of God coming to the individual, to the person of Isaiah. And outside of scripture, goodness knows how many people have experienced that time when suddenly the Lord has come to his temple, when he's come to them. The hymn writer, um, Henry Francis Light, springs to mind. Henry Francis Light was in a, in a dark place of, light, uh, uh, of life. For a start, his girlfriend, his fiance, in fact, whom he was intending to marry, jilted him, and he was very cut up about that. And for another thing, he was fast losing his sight, and he knew that in a very short while he would become totally blind. And so he was in a very dark space. But it was at that time that he wrote those famous words of the hymn, Abide With Me. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, Lord of the helpless, oh, abide with me. And it was at that moment of darkness that the Lord suddenly came to his temple. It's a truth 
that we find in expressions like, um, and for instance, in Deuteronomy, where it says, underneath are the everlasting arms. There, at the times when you least expect it, there is the presence of God. Or from the Psalms, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there I shall find you, for your right hand will hold me. It's true on the individual level. Sometimes God comes when you least expect it, but he comes into human hearts and into human lives. And often, I might say, not always, but often, it is at the times of greatest needs, the greatest need. It is, I think, a truth which is also true at, um, at the level of the church. Um, Ephesians chapter 2 talks about the church being the temple of the Lord. There was a church some years ago now, it was a church in Scotland, and I can't remember uh, exactly where it was. It was a story that was told when we lived in Scotland, but, uh, and that was quite a long time ago. And I can't just remember the place, but it was a Church of Scotland church, and um, it was sort of um, fair to middling, you know, how churches sometimes are. And their minister left and went off to a new parish, and they were in something of a quandary because their treasurer looked at the books and said, I don't know whether we can afford a new minister. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Hmm. And um, so they debated what to do, and they, they thought long and hard, and they thought, well, naturally, no, they couldn't, uh, they couldn't raise the funds to appoint anybody. Well, they heard that there was a, a retired Church of Scotland minister living fairly nearby, a man in his 70s, and they just wondered whether he might be tempted to work perhaps part-time on a reduced stipend, therefore, and uh, perhaps he would come and sort of, you know, plug the gap, as it were. So they approached this man, and he did, and um, he was a man who'd had, um, well, an average sort of ministry. He'd worked hard and uh, achieved uh, uh, consistent but not spectacular results. He'd seen uh, moderate advances in the work of the churches that he had served and so on, but nothing, uh, nothing out of the ordinary and nothing particularly spectacular. But anyway, he agreed and he came to this church and he began his ministry there. And suddenly, the church just took off. Six months after he arrived, they had the Harvest Festival, and there were so many people that they struggled to get them in. And suddenly there were opportunities for mission, suddenly things were happening. The Lord whom you seek suddenly came to his temple. It works at the church level as well. Uh, there was a discussion taking place about the decline of the church, and, uh, and various people were um, bemoaning the fact that congregations all over the country were declining. And some said how despondent they were about the future. And there were no young people in the church. And, uh, well, we're all familiar with the conversation. And the, the, the people sat in this room talking about this. I was one of the people, I have to say. And um, then one elderly lady, Doris her name was, she sat and listened to this conversation for some time. And then, when she'd listened for a bit, she spoke with what I can only describe as the wisdom of age. She'd listened to all these people, and then she said, I disagree with you. She said, when I, took, when I look back over history, there have been other times like this, when the church has gone into decline and people have fallen away and there has been a religious revival. Now, she said, when I look round today and I see the lack of interest in faith, in the things of faith, when I see the rampant material, when I see the general godlessness in many sections of society, well, then I would have to say that the time is getting right very nearly for revival once again, and it will happen just as it happened in the past. Now, what she said 
was a statement of hope and of confidence and of faith in this very thing, that the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. It is true for the church. But it's true at another level as well, I think. I think it is true for the world at large. In the book of uh, Genesis, chapter 1, it says that God created the firmament. And intriguingly, the word used for firmament is also the word which is used for, to describe the, temp the, the ceiling of the temple. They use the same word, the, the Jewish word. I don't, I don't know, I'm, I'm not a Hebrew scholar and I don't know what the Jew Hebrew word for firmament is. But anyway, the word they use, God created the firmament. He created the ceiling of the temple. This, the whole point of this season of the year, this time of Advent, is when we begin to anticipate Christmas again, it's that Christ came into the world unexpectedly, or at least largely unexpectedly. I know there were the, the Annas and the Simeons of this world who were expecting, but let's face it, the vast majority of the populace was not. And so, suddenly the Lord whom you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple. I think it is the, the way of Christ that whatever you see happening in his earthly life, all the things that we see recorded that Jesus did in the Gospels, you also see as things that are happening in the ongoing work and ministry in the world today. That is to say, when good things happen, that can be seen as the work of Christ. There was a lovely story in the news this week. I don't know whether you saw it. It was about a woman who heard of the plight of some of the Afghan refugees. And she had a house. And she gave this house to a refugee family. And, uh, and they came, and they lived in it, and, and, and they were so grateful, you can imagine. Suddenly, hope had come to them. But you see, that was an example of Christ coming to his temple, Christ coming in the world, because wasn't what she did the work of Christ? Isn't that just what he did? Do you remember how he said, I was homeless, and you took me in? That's what that woman did. That is Christ coming to his temple of the world. So, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. It applies to individuals, it applies to the church, and it applies to the world. But there is a snag. Because Malachi goes on. The Lord whom you are looking for will suddenly come to his temple. And then he says, but who will be able to endure the day when he comes? He will be like strong soap, like refiner's fire. Excuse me. It's like when you're looking forward to somebody coming, but you know that they're going to want to change things. And time and time again, when Jesus comes into situations, he wants to change things, doesn't he? Like Paul on the Damascus, Damascus Road. No, one, no, no doubt it was a wonderful experience, but Paul was never the same again, was he? He was changed forever. Or think of the Protestant Reformation. We might want to argue, well, this was Christ coming to his temple. Well, it probably was. But the church was never the same again. And think of the world too. It has been said that all of the armies that ever marched and all of the kings that ever reigned and all of the parliaments that ever sat, even put together, have not had as much effect on the world as that one life born at Bethlehem. And I am sure that the will of God is that we should go on changing 
until that day when, as the hymn puts it, the earth shall be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. The Lord you are looking for will suddenly come to his temple. And when he does, nothing is ever the same again. But it's true that he comes to people and we are never the same again. He comes to the church and it is never the same again. And he comes to the world and it is never the same again. We sing a hymn now about uh, Jesus coming. It's 168. Heavenly Father, as we offer these gifts, we rededicate our lives, we rededicate our church, we rededicate our work in the world once again to your glory. And we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we move to our prayers and then to the communion. As we remember the communion and as we remember Christ coming into the world and as we remember the Last Supper, we take that also as an event which affects the whole world and it is therefore appropriate that we should pray for the world as we prepare to share in this bread and this wine. So let us pray. O oh God our Father, as we come before this table of the Lord, we come not just on our own behalf, but we come as part of the world in which we live, a world for which you call us to pray. We offer our prayers, therefore, for the peace of the world, we hold before you the tensions which lie between the nations. We hold before you the mistrust between different philosophies, different cultures, different ways of life. The tensions between East and West. The tensions between rich and poor the tensions between the powerless and the powerful. We pray for the peace of Christ, the justice of Christ, the love of Christ, to be born afresh into the world, that the rulers of the world and people of power and people of responsibility, uh, uh, people of resource and wealth, may use their responsibility with a sense of justice, a sense of compassion, a sense of care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We offer our prayers for the church within the world. We pray that we may never become down, downhearted but that we may have the light of faith in our hearts, that our hearts and lives may be filled with compassion and with peace, that we may be enabled to share love, to share justice, to share the gospel. We pray for the unity of the church, and we pray for the, to see the power of your Spirit on the hearts and lives of all your people. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We offer our prayers for particular situations about which we are concerned or which, about which we have heard. We think of that little boy, Arthur, murdered by those closest to him. We think of the tragedy and the pain and the suffering that he suffered. And we know that he is not alone. There are children up and down our land. And indeed there are other people who are abused at the hands of others. We offer our prayers for them. We offer our prayers for those who are charged with the task of helping them, that they may be guided and strengthened. We pray for the peace, for, the, for justice, for love to come upon the lives of all the vulnerable and all the abused. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And let us also, in a moment or two of quiet, hold before God the particular thoughts and reflections which may lie upon any of our hearts. Let us bring those also before God's throne of grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we offer our prayers in Jesus' name, and we ask that you will answer them in accordance with your will. Amen. And we share together in the words that Jesus taught us as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Now, O oh Father God, we lift up our hearts before you because it is always right that in every time and in every place we should offer praise and worship. But as we come to this table this morning, we know that we have a special reason for doing so. Because we rejoice in the coming of Jesus Christ into the world. Although you revealed your love, in creation and through the lives of the prophets, yet even so, people strayed away from your ways. But you never deserted humanity. And in Jesus, you came afresh. In Jesus, we see that you, the Lord of all, can live a human life, die a human death, suffer at human hands. And we know that Jesus did all of that. But we also know that your spirit so moved upon him as to bring him through the, the throes of death into the glorious light of resurrection and ascension. And we rejoice in these things, Lord God, as we do so, we remember that command that he gave to his disciples as they met round the table 
on that Thursday evening before the crucifixion. We remember him taking bread and wine and sharing it and instructing his disciples, his friends, to do so in perpetuity and to remember. And so we obey that command. We rejoice that we do not obey it alone, but in company with all your people, all those who profess the name of Jesus and who cry out, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so, Father God, in our turn, we gather around this table as part of that great fellowship of people and part of the community of faith. Amen. Now, the narrative of the institution we take this morning from the Gospel according to St. Luke. St. Luke, chapter 22, and beginning to read at verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus took his place at the table with the apostles. He said to them, I have wanted so much to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will never eat it again until it is given its full meaning in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus took a cup, gave thanks to God and said, take this and share it among yourselves. I tell you that from now on, I will not drink this wine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took a piece of bread, gave thanks to God and broke it and gave it to, to, gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in memory of me. In the same way, he gave them the cup after supper, saying, This cup is God's new covenant, sealed with my blood, which is poured out for you. Thanks be to God. So, Father God, as we have heard those words, we pray that you will pour out your Spirit upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that they may be for us the body and the blood of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Now, you are invited to come forward to receive the bread and the wine. Let us receive of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, broken for us and shed for us. Let us pray. Father God, as you have drawn us together and united us in this sacrament, so may we go out into the world as a united people of God, a united people of God filled with hope, filled with joy, filled with the promise of your eternal banquet prepared for all your people. And may your blessing and peace go upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. And we sing the hymn 264, 264, a hymn which is sometimes used on Palm Sunday, but which is equally appropriate for Advent as we think of the coming of Christ in a different way from the way he came on Palm Sunday, but coming nevertheless. Make way, make way, for Christ the King in splendour arrives. And let us share the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. <laughs>